Welcome back everybody. Today we're going over this rifle that you see in my hands right now and that you guys saw throughout the intro. This is the uh, Caracal 816A2 and it is a piston driven AR style rifle. Now Caracal, for those that don't know, is headquartered in the UAE and uh, they have recently opened manufacturing capability in production, full production in the US here in New Hampshire. So this rifle here was made in the US, but its lineage definitely goes back to the UAE. So we'll sort of back up a little bit on that one. Uh, in the Middle East, there's not a lot of gun manufacturing going on outside of like the, you know, sort of factories in a box that were exported there uh, by the Soviet Union during the Cold War. So that really is all they had sort of uh, in terms of manufacturing capabilities for firearms. The UAE wanted to change that. And of course, they've uh, brought a couple pistols to market that we've showed you here on the channel. A couple of them had some recall issues in America. And uh, now they're actually making weapons 100% here in the United States, and this is one of those examples. They're also making a few other rifles here in the U.S. as well in New Hampshire. So basically, this rifle here was designed to be sort of the ultimate desert reliable gun. Um, and the folks that designed it were actually the same folks that designed the HK416, the SIG 516, and then now this, the 816 here from Caracal. So um, 416 has been a tremendously successful rifle, uh, tons and tons of military adoption around the world. It's a very proven design, it's a very reliable design. Uh, the 516 really never kind of caught on, had some issues in terms of quality control here in the US. And uh, the 816 here is supposed to be an improved version of both of those with a simplified gas system that's a little bit smoother and uh, also more reliable. So that's what they claim. And uh, when I was at the NRA show this year, uh, the folks from Caracal came up to me and they wanted me to review this rifle and I was saying that, you know, generally speaking, I'm more into the DI type of rifles for AR-15s. I think pistons oftentimes kind of are a problem in search of a solution, if that makes sense. Um, but with the lineage of this being from the 416 and the 516, um, I was kind of interested because like I said, the 416 is a very, very good rifle and it's very proven. So I agreed to get one of these in for review, which this rifle is. I've had this one in for several months now. We fired just over 1500 rounds through it so far. Had a grand total, zero malfunctions. So that certainly is a good thing. It's a good start, right? So uh, what we're gonna do next is let the dogs take a look at it. And once it gets their seal of approval, we'll step outside and uh, see what kind of accuracy we can get out of this rifle. Time to see how this rifle can shoot. We got a few different loads here that we're gonna run through it, uh, different weights to see if it has any sort of preference that way. Uh, target is downrange at 100 yards. We have the uh, primary arms four to 14 scope on there. Uh, it's super hot out today, so that's my excuse. <laughs> it's about 111 degrees. Dew point is 79, so it is hot. Uh, that's why I'm sitting in the shade, trying to kind of compensate a little bit. But anyway, uh, enough yapping from me. Uh, the gun is factory, so no fancy triggers in there, just the mil spec one that it comes with. First load up is going to be the Browning 223 50 grain. This is their varmint load, and we'll see how it does with the lighter weight ammo. Looks like a pretty good group there. Uh, I just, right before I'm filming this, I just shot uh, with a, a Geissele SSAE trigger, I think. And uh, the difference is stark in the uh, mil spec category. Next up is going to be the uh, Gorilla Ammunition 77 grain load, 223. 
It's got the uh, Sierra Match King bullet in there, so it's gonna be heavy for caliber this time. And we'll see how it likes this load. Alrighty, again, a decent looking group there. I'm not mad about it. Uh, last up is gonna be the uh, Freedom Munitions. This is their 69 grain hull point boat tail remanufactured stuff. Tends to shoot pretty well, so we'll see how she does in this rifle. Let's go check them out. First up, of course, was that 50 grain browning load. It shot pretty darn well. We're definitely center to center right at an inch there. So we got our MOA group out of the way. Then we came over here with the 77 grainer from a Gorilla. And center to center, we're right about an inch and an eighth, just under an inch and a quarter on that one. And the Freedom, we had that one flyer. Who knows, but we count them all here. So that one's right at two inches center to center. So overall, I'd say the rifle shoots pretty darn well. Getting into the details of the rifle, we'll start out here at the muzzle and work our way back. We do have an A2 muzzle device and it does have half by 28 threads on there. So if you want to add any of your favorite aftermarket muzzle devices or suppressors, you certainly can do so. It's got the common US thread pitch there, which is nice. Moving on back to the barrel, they call it a modified M4 profile barrel, but it really kind of isn't. Um, back here underneath the hand guards, it's a little bit thicker. And uh, then up here we have a 0.75 inch gas block and then it kind of narrows down again and it kind of opens up a little bit here at the end. It's a weird profile barrel in my opinion, um, but from what I understand this is the profile that they did uh, their 10,000 rounds of testing with uh, for the NATO reliability standards and uh, that's what they wanted to go with. They wanted to make sure that it was a tested and proven profile and that's what it is. Moving back to the gas block and the gas system, that's where some of the really unique features of this rifle come into play. As you guys can see, there's a three position gas system. Um, so this is the standard setting here where it's up at the 12 o'clock position. If you want to add gas to it, um, you're just gonna push this little button in here and move it over at the same time and it'll click right in. That's gonna give you increased gas. So why you, what you would wanna do that is if your rifle was really dirty, um, you hadn't cleaned it in a while, really dry, and maybe in really cold conditions, or if you're using some substandard ammo like uh, Wolf or Tula and you wanted to increase the reliability of it, that's when you're gonna open the gas system up. Again, to push it back, you're just gonna push this in and go back to the middle position, and it also has a reduced gas setting here. Oops which is right there. And uh, that's gonna be for suppressed fire. So it's gonna reduce the amount of gas going back in the system, um, making it a little bit smoother uh, when you're using a suppressor. Or if you just have really hot ammo for whatever reason, that can make it a little bit smoother as well. To remove the gas system, you're just gonna rotate it here, 180 degrees, and it'll pop right out. This piston system is gonna look similar to some systems that you guys may have seen out there, but it's simplified versus most of them. Um, so it can actually be disassembled a little bit further than this. We can pull this piece out, and what you'll see here on the end of that piston is this little uh, gas ring on there. And what that's for is to prevent, or rather uh, not require the system to be over gas. So what I mean by that is if you guys think of like an AK-47 uh, in where the piston and the gas tube sits, uh, it's very loose tolerances in there. So therefore most AKs, factory AKs, are over gassed intentionally from the factory for added reliability because they know it's gonna bleed off around that um, gas system there. This one with that ring, removes that necessity for overgassing. So nice tight fit in there and you guys can see the three different positions for the gas system as the gas is actually coming up out of the barrel port. And then moving on back, you can see that we do have these pieces uh, pushed together with a roll pin so it's all gonna stay in one place and it's not gonna go anywhere. It's a very simple system. When simple it is good in terms of reliability, so that is good. And you guys can see there how it reacts with the carrier when it's in the closed position. A few more details on the barrel that we didn't touch on already is that it's made out of 4150 CMB steel. It's made here in the United States and it does have a QPQ or nitrided finish. Uh, the original ones uh, over there in the UAE are gonna have a cold hammer forged chrome wine barrel. 
uh, when they brought the production over here, they tested this barrel that you see here versus the original Coldheimer Forge chrome line one, and uh, they didn't see any difference in terms of longevity or durability or anything like that. So they found that this actually had greater corrosion resistance, and that's why they went with it. It wasn't a cost-cutting measure. Um, I'll let you guys debate that down below in the comments section, but um, there's other rifle barrel manufacturers that have said the same thing, So, um, but there's also folks who are diehard, you know, FN, Coldheimer Forge barrel guys. So really, it's up to you, but that is the way they offer it here in the United States. Another difference here in the United States versus the uh, UAE rifles is that these are going to have a free-floated M-Lock end versus the UAE one that's going to have a 1913 spec rail. Again, it really didn't have anything to do with uh, um, you know cost savings or anything like that, but what they found in terms of research was that basically you know the world's moving to M-Lock. Even military units are moving to M-Lock out there, so it has the M-Lock slots there at the 3, 6, and 9 o'clock positions for adding any type of accessories that you would want to on there. Then we have these lightning cuts in there to help with cooling and also reduce the weight. Uh, we also have quick detach sling swivel points here on the front on both the sort of 11 and 1 o'clock positions. And the rifle itself does come with a two position sling, a quick adjust sling, sort of like a, like a Magpul or you know, like a Vickers Tactical type of design, and it's very easy to use. It does come with it, like I said, from the factory, so that is nice. One thing that's cool about this handguard is the way it interfaces with the upper receiver. So the upper is a Forge 7075 T6 aluminum upper receiver, and uh, it's milled here in a way that's obviously different than most uh, mill spec uppers, and uh, it's got the interface there with the handguard, so there's really no way it could rotate. And then we have helicoils in here, and these two screws that are set in place. Um, it be It would be a very hard... Thing for me to imagine what would cause this handguard to come loose. Super, super secure system, and I do like it overall. I'm sure some of you already picked up on it, but the rifle does come with these sights as well. These are uh, backup folding iron sights, and they do go down by pressing in there on the side of this big button, and then pushing them down. They snap and lock into place. Same thing on the way up. When they're up, they're locked. When they're down, they're not, so you can just pull them up without having to hit the button. Same thing is going to be true here on the rear, but what's cool, again, about that upper receiver and uh, this rear sight is that with the aperture in the down position here, um, you can actually close it. Now, a lot of you guys are familiar with metal backup AR-15 sights, and that's not the case. You guys can see there, it's actually milled out on the upper receiver to work correctly with that sight in the down position. So I thought that was kind of a cool little touch there. Again, it's not locked in the down position, just friction, but once you get it in the up position, it is locked into place, and we have those two apertures for night fire or you know CQB type fire, and then a little bit more precision with the smaller aperture. The upper receiver has these subdued T marks on there that continue out on the handguards as well. And uh, it is dry film lubricated when you get it in from the factory. Of course, mine's been shot a bunch and uh, <laughs> that dry film lubricant can't be seen anymore just due to regular lubricant. But one cool thing about this uh, upper receiver and the chamber of this barrel is that's unique is that this barrel it has what they call over the beach capability. And I believe the HK416 has the same and it's a similar design, but what they did is they designed the chamber to be a little bit different than your standard 556 chamber. It's gonna be a little bit tighter where it locks up here with the bolt, which we'll get to here in just a second. And it's also gonna have a steel reinforcing pin that lines up right here on the extractor. So I'll see if I can show that to you here. Uh, I might be able to get it here on camera if we can. Yeah, so if you look right there on the side, I'll see, put a little arrow on it. That little pin, that steel pin that's sticking out there is not normal. If you guys are used to looking at like an AR-15 chamber. And what that's there for is to press up against the extractor in the event of like an overpressure type of situation. Um, so if you had a bore obstruction, let's say some sand in there or whatever the case may be, uh, the the pressure wouldn't be able to release out the side like it normally would and blow the extractor out um, because it's supported there when the bolt is in a locked up position and any kind of overpressure would have to go down the barrel. So say you had sand or something like that in your barrel or any other type of obstruction like a rock or something like that, the pressure would go forward and push it out and then you could fire your next round and the barrel is tested for that. So the barrel is HP and MP tested, plus it has that unique chamber support to give you that capability that if you do have an obstruction, you don't have to worry about blowing the side of your rifle out. The bolt carrier group here is gonna look a little bit different than what you guys are probably used to seeing on most AR-15. Some things are pretty standard. Actually, the firing pin is one of them. It is standard in that regard. And our little cam pin is as well. And pull that out. 
and our bolt. So uh, basically what we have going on here on the carrier is that we have its 8620 material and then it is nitride finished as well. So it's got the same QPQ treatment as the barrel for corrosion resistance and uh, just durability overall. And what you'll see here on the rear is that it kind of has a little bit of a chamfer in addition to being lightning cut. So what I mean by that is up here, it might be hard to tell on camera, is actually a little bit smaller in dimension than it is back here on the rear and that's to prevent carrier tilt so a lot of uh, piston guns out there have had issues with that over the years uh, you guys have actually heard me talk about it those of you who have watched the channel for a long time and that's what it's there for it's the same reason you have these lines sticking out here that you guys can see the wear that's to prevent the carrier tilt as it goes back because that piston is hitting right here on the gas key which actually isn't a gas key of course in this case it's a one-piece design for those that didn't pick up on that and it wants to tilt a little bit now those pieces here in the rear that champ that geometry rather prevents it from doing that and prevents the carrier tilt which certainly is a good thing another thing here on a bolt it is made out of a 158 carpenter steel it is mp tested and hp tested and uh, if you look at the rear on the radius here of the lugs you can see a little bit of chamfering and again that's going to be to give you a little bit more dwell time and make it a little bit slower cycling and a little bit smoother cycling which i do like overall it's one of those small details when it goes um or rather when it all comes together with the gas system and the uh, buffer system that we'll show you here in just a second makes it a very smooth rifle overall to shoot just like the upper receiver, the lower is made from a Forge 7076 block of aluminum. It is type 3 hard anodized, just like the upper, and is mil spec in terms of you can drop a mil spec upper onto it, like in Colt M4 upper or something like that. You can put it right on there and it will function. Now, there are some things that are, of course, not mil spec, as you guys can probably tell by looking at it, but most of your AR 15 lower receiver parts will fit in here just fine. That includes the trigger. So, the trigger, like we mentioned, is just a mil spec affair. Breaks pretty clean right at six pounds, but it's nothing fancy, nothing to write home about. But if you want to drop, say, like a Geissele trigger or something like that in there, you can do so. If you want to use ambi safeties, anything like that for the AR 15, they should work in there just fine. Also, you guys can see that the shelf there is milled out, so that way if you wanted to run any sort of uh, either a full auto trigger or any of the like echo triggers or binary triggers out there, you can use those in this lower receiver. Now, we also have this little piece right here, which is a uh, spring tension tensioning device. So it's kind of, I'm not sure if you guys can see it moving there, but it's moving just so slightly. And what that does is it uh, comes up underneath the grip here, and it's a screw with a spring in there. And it ensures that your upper and lower receiver have a very tight fit and so nothing can get in there no dirt none of that sand stuff and uh, it's going to give you good reliability and it's also just going to feel a little bit better uh, moving up here to the mag wall you guys can see it does have a good flare to it it aids in reloads by giving you a little bit bigger area to shove your magazine into which certainly is nice our trigger guard here is just a standard usgi type if you want to drop you know like a magpul or bcm in there you can do so and it will work just fine on the right side of the receiver, there's not a ton going on here. We have our standard safe and fire position indicated, um, but it is not an ambidextrous safety. Like I said, you can drop one in though, no problem. The grip here is actually made in the UAE. It's one of the few parts on this rifle that is. Um, you can see here, it kind of has like a BCM sort of uh, overview profile, but it is very different, of course, in the way it's actually executed. And we do have a storage compartment in the rear if you guys want to store batteries for your optics or anything like that in there. And the end plate here has these two positions here where you can use like a hook type of device to hook your sling in there. I know the HK claws work in there and several other uh, type of devices will work in there. I believe the Magpul MS3 slings will also clip right in there just fine. So if you want to utilize that, you can. If not, we do have a ton of sling mounting points here on the stock, which we'll get to here in just a second. You guys can see there the castle nut is well staked on there. That is nice. And our buffer tube is a mil spec six position tube. 7075 T6 aluminum. And one thing that's cool that I kind of indicated it earlier was this buffer here. So this buffer is unique. And uh, again, it's designed for making the rifle fire smoothly. And uh, the actual weight on this is gonna be the same weight as a uh, H3 buffer would be. However, if I shake it, shake it near the microphone, you guys can hear that there's no actual weights moving around in there. There's actually tungsten powder in there. And uh, that's to prevent a few things. It's to prevent any sort of a uh, bolt bounce. It's also to prevent, or uh, rather to make the rifle just a little bit smoother overall in terms of recoil, uh, which it definitely has. And the stock here is the Magpul STR stock, a very good stock overall. I actually have a full dedicated review of this stock, but it has a nice wide cheek piece here for shooting from the prone or even, you know, shooting standing up. It gives you a little bit more uh, area there to place your face on. It has the two uh, sleeves in there where you can put batteries, anything like that in the tubes. 
And of course, you see it's very quickly adjustable in whatever position you want it in. If you want to lock it into place so that way it doesn't move on you, you can do so with that lever. And of course, we have the sling attachment points here uh, for either your you know, traditional slings or your QD mount as well. We've shown you the accuracy. We've also shown you how the rifle works in terms of operation. One thing that we didn't talk about though, in terms of ARs that's always important is gonna be weight. This rifle here comes in at seven pounds and six ounces on my scale, unloaded with an unloaded magazine. And it does come with a magazine, I should mention that. For those of you guys that live in free states, it'll come with a Lancer 30 round magazine. It also comes with that sling and it comes with an Otis cleaning kit as well, which is a legit cleaning kit. It's a very, very good cleaning kit for what it's worth. Um, like I said, very smooth shooting gun. I was generally against pistons overall because a piston system guys it will run cleaner and uh, cooler back here in the chamber area where your bolt is operating no doubt about it that is an advantage you get but you do get a little bit of carbon buildup around the piston itself so you still have to clean it and maintain it um, but in terms of adverse conditions a lot of folks feel that pistons uh, systems here are going to be more durable and reliable that very well may be uh, this particular rifle design here has been submitted for NATO testing and it has passed all testing in terms of reliability, which is pretty rare uh, for AR style rifles that aren't built in the US or Germany. Those tend to be the ones that pass. So that is a good sign here for this rifle. And uh, again, it's got a pretty good track record, a pretty good design history with the folks behind it. And here in the US, it seems to be well made as you guys can see here. So uh, price point, which we didn't talk about, which is always important as well, is not cheap. Um, the rifle here, if you look online, is going for like $1,649. So yeah, I mean, it's not cheap. It's competing with like the BCMs and the Daniel Defenses of the world. Um, but for some folks, uh, this design will be worth it. Some of you guys, it will not be worth it. Um, but what I wanted to do here today was kind of present you guys with what they're offering, how it's performed so far for me, and just my general thoughts on it. So if you guys have any questions about the rifle, anything like that, you can always post those down below in the comment section. You can also post those over at my Facebook page as always. But thanks for watching, guys. Thanks for subscribing. And I hope to see all of you in the next video. Thank <laughs> you.